Sometimes reading a book is like playing a game. In the case of Ryan Nicholas Stanker's new text, Wesley and the Anglicans, Political Divisions and Early Evangelicism, it's similar to an experience of playing Django. When playing Django, one constructs a teetering tower of small blocks, then pulls it apart piece by piece until it collapses. Danker uses this paradigm to capture the long debated and misunderstood relationship between John Wesley and the Anglicans. He creates layer upon layer of historical narrative to explain relationships, then starts tugging at the interconnected pieces. In the end, he clearly shows us how tenuous the relationship between Wesley and the evangelical Anglicism came tumbling down. Danker is a doctor of theology at Boston University and a longtime scholar of evangelicism, Wesleyan theology, and the Church of England. His new entry into the, the field of Wesley's relationship with Anglicans is a transformation of his doctoral dissertation that he did at Duke University into a fresh historical narrative of the Wesley movement. Danker uses a vast collage of original sources, be them letters, lectures, and even tribunal documents, as well as countless biographies and historical narratives written continuously following Wesley's death. Over a hundred authors fill his pool of primary sources with a collection of secondary sources, twice that number. To compare Danker's approach to a game of jangle, is as he intended. He invites the reader to experience his work as nine independent but associated chapters. He begins with evangelicism. It's being tested within the Church of England and he lays out a foundation irrespective of Methodism. So Danker describes the evangelicals as a fraternal organization they exist on the fringes of the church. Their loose-knit fellowship was uh, on a mission to teach what Bebbington defines as the four defining principles of evangelical scholarship. Conversionism, activism, biblicalism, and crucicentrism. The evangelical layer is then intertwined with the arrival of John Wesley, and at times his brother Charles. So Danker provides a fresh insight into the conversion of Wesley and his warming of the heart experience. Danker joins others in recounting uh, Wesley's stages in his evolution. He was initially intrigued by pietism. He had a failed Jacobian experiment in Georgia, a following relationship with Moravians, and finally, his evolving personal evangelism. For Danker, Wesley's Aldergate experience was his entrance into evangelicism, wherein he conceived and then later perfected a conversion model he would then proselytize. Danker consistently reminds the reader of Wesley's roots and fidelity to the Church of England and his unlikely duality as both a high church member and as well as a rebel-rousing, irregular evangelist. So as chapter three arrives, we have a pretty good understanding of the aspirations of the evangelicals embedded within the church and equally the motivations of Wesley. However, the public outcry against what is perceived, at, perceived as a brewing radicalism uh, from the, uh, the high church clergy, it fans the fire of vitriol. And imagine Facebook existing in the mid 1700s. That's what Danker describes as a betrayal of the pamphlets, leaflets, and news articles used to stoke the flames against Wesley and the Methodist. Caught in the crossfire and guilty by association were the parish, parish bound evangelical clergy risking their careers and their livelihoods. Within chapters four and five, 
He exhaustively illustrates the unrelenting push of Methodists upon the domain of the evangelicals and their volatile reprisals. Surprisingly, while Wesley is routinely warned of his disruptive and the negative impact he's having on the church that he so dearly loves, he seems oblivious. Danker prescribes Wesley's brand of Methodism as fostering a new ethos, and that is both radical and borderline. This is the final layer of the tower. Having been reared at the feet of Wesley, many of his lay preachers wish nothing less than the full authority of Oxford or Cambridge degree clergy, their right to tend to a flock of their own, even if they do abscond it from an evangelical parish. And they want to be able to administer the Eucharist. The blocks begin to fall as Danker describes the Methodist clergy, including his brother Charles, publicly fly, fighting against them. As Danker tugs at more blocks, he provides a new perspective on the size of the conferences and the number of combatants fueling the animosity. The once collegial Methodists and the evangelicals are no longer getting along. By chapter six, it's obvious the end is near as backfighting grows among the Methodists and reaches untenable proportions. The conferences between the 1770 through 1784 put Methodism on a new course and the evangelicals become a casualty of the political war. King George III's England Danker quotes Edmund Gibson as saying, is the politics, I'm sorry, politics was a branch of theology. Dissent is considered a threat and dealt with in political and theological faction. Six Oxford students, none of them were Methodists, are cited for lay preaching and expelled from Oxford as a warning shot for all evangelicals, be them Wesley's troop or not. Interestingly, Danker closes his text with his own brand of historiography. While somewhat dismissing of the predestinations versus perfectionism controversy, he claims it's a single source or it has a single source genesis. He cleverly revisits John Wesley and his high churchman status as one continuous thread throughout his legacy. Danker's retrospective presents a Wesley that was born, raised, confirmed, lived, and died with the fidelity to the Church of England. And it's not unlike Dr. Eisenbaum's thought-provoking book, Paul Was Not a Christian. Danker is equally ambitious by reinforcing John Wesley as Anglican above Methodist. Danker provides a compelling presentation of Wesley and his interaction with the Anglicans. The vast quantity of footnotes makes his argument both cohesive and relevant. His nine chapters of freestanding narrative are potentially a breakthrough interpretation upon the landscape of Methodism. Now, while this is not a text for those that are unfamiliar with the legend of John Wesley, uh, specifically a timeline of his life and the events as they happen, it nonetheless, it's a scholarly work worthy of any serious Wesley researcher or Methodist lay person. Danker has created a fun new paradigm by turning history into a building block game of interlocking factions, ethos, and politics. It's suitable for ages 13 and above. Thank you for your time. There we go. Weeks. Page up. Stop. Forward. It's going a thousand miles an hour. I can't read that fast. But it's still filming me, I think. Okay, let's just start it from scratch. <laughs> You're such a brat. What is it with me and brooms today? I, I don't know.